Hey everybody, hello and welcome to Internet 2030, the first of uh, Coindesk's first two uh, conversations about the future of the internet. Uh, today we're going to be talking with Filecoin and also with Consensus a little bit later on. Uh, for those who don't remember, Filecoin was a uh, giant initial coin offering that came out of Protocol Labs, uh, which is meant to change the way that uh, data is stored around the internet, uh, truly transform the way that we store the information the internet needs. Um, we've been waiting since 2017 for the protocol to come forth and we are getting very close. So today we're here with the founder of Filecoin, Juan Benet, who we've talked with before. And also this time we're here with Colin Everin, uh, who's also with the Filecoin team, a part of the business development team working on the Filecoin ecosystem. So uh, welcome to you both. Great to talk to you again. Great to see you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Freddy. Hey, how's it going? Good to meet you, Colin. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. So um, let's just start off on the basics here. Um, why does the internet need to be reinvented and why is storage the place to start? So we live in a world where most of our human activity is assisted by computers. Um, every year, more and more of our interactions have happen entirely online or assisted by computers in some way. So most of our communications, most of our conversations are going through digital media. These platforms, the, the ones that are moving around all our information and storing it, uh, have a bunch of different flaws. So uh, one big one is that most of the data, though encrypted from your computer to their computers, it's sort, usually stored in the clear, and that is not protecting user, user privacy in the long term. Um, you can imagine a situation where um, anybody can go through that data in the future um, you know, things are fine now in, in a lot of countries, but that's not always the case. History has shown that sometimes bad parties take take um, take power and then they could go over and have corporations like this turn over huge droves of data and they could go and, and rifle through that. So that's like a, a pretty dangerous <laughs> a place to be. Um, the other part of it is that the, the current centralization of the market causes this very difficult situation where there's basically a few centralized monopolies that control most of the digital infrastructure that we use, most of the applications and platforms go through those monopolies. And that who makes Who are it, those monopolies, Juan? Who, who, who are we talking about here? Yeah, I mean, so, so it's basically like the cloud, the cloud, the large cloud companies, right? So it's it's Amazon, Google, uh, to some extent, Apple, and a few others. Um, some tiny companies you're taking on there, some just really little guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's this world where networks can actually fight against uh, large centralized players, right? So this is not us taking on these, these groups. It's either creating, it's really creating a marketplace and a network where uh, the all of us together can actually compete, right? Rather than taking on one-on-one -on -one fights with a giant, uh, let's all of us band together and actually right. uh, create some like better better infrastructure with better rights. Right. Uh, um, okay, so uh, great, great. So um, yeah, and just to sort of put some flesh on what you were saying there, just a good example. Let me know if I have this right, but. Um, this idea of data not being stored at rest, right? Like I happen to use Proton Mail for my personal email, which is a, an encrypted email provider. So that means if they actually did manage to break into Pro Proton Mail, which is unlikely, they would just be like, what's all this gobbledygook? But that's not the truth for most data storage providers, right? If you can get in the front door, you can find everything. That's right. So most of the data on most sessions is stored entirely in the clear. And you know, this is one of the difficulties with the advertising revenue model as well. So both the cloud the way that clouds work today and the advertising model, uh, business model, the, both of those kind of promote a lot of user data being stored entirely in the clear so that companies can go through and look at it and understand how to um, how to advertise better and so on. Or just simply for convenience in many cases, like the cloud computing um, infrastructure was developed this way and people don't, users haven't really requested this as a major change. Um, and so we are in a, this really vulnerable position where um, just tons of data is, is entirely uh, in the clear. Um, and we really need to move to a world where uh, we have user protecting encryption, where what you are doing, what, what you're saying online and what you're uh, talking to your friends about and your, and your family members and so on, isn't being tracked and collected so that in the future it might uh, come back and hurt you. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, and so why is it important to fix this for us to start with uh, data storage? I mean, you gave us one reason, sort of it's encrypted at rest, so that's a good one. Um, what else? Because I mean, you know, one thing people often say on this topic is, um, the one thing that keeps getting cheaper and cheaper on the internet is storing data. So why is this a good business? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's one of the one of the reasons why why it makes sense to to distribute it this way. And we, we can actually have a, a, a um, you know, it, it's possible for a new network and a new entrant to come into the picture because the just the volumes of data are, are growing tremendously every year. So it's really the future is anybody's game in a sense. Um, 
and the, the the really key reason to start there um, and, and to really help, so you know kind of the, the world of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and blockchains in general um, have helped us gain a much better um, financial infrastructure where we now have certain systems that that are um, that at least promote the ability to transfer um, uh, money and transfer value and so on well, with certain kinds of rights. Uh, we need to move that kind of um, user protect user centered and user protecting um, uh, set of rights to data storage. And the reason <clears throat> to start there is um, most of the information that we're that we're transmitting and, and and distributing and so on, all the applications are stored somewhere, right? So all of our conversations, all of the 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 um, chat streams, <clears throat> video, all of that kind of stuff is stored somewhere. Somebody has to uh, store it and transmit it to other people. That's like, we we want to just convert all of that into into a properly decentralized uh, market that anybody can participate in. So Colin, I'm going to turn to you in just one second here, but just want to say for folks who, who just saw this on the Coindesk front page or wherever you found it, just tuned in. We're here at Internet 2030. Uh, it's our Coindesk Live series talking about the future of the web. If folks have questions they want to ask, probably the best way to do that is hashtag Internet 2030 on Twitter. We've got folks watching that. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, I think there's a little chat function on the side. There's folks watching that there. So just uh, throw those questions in. We're happy to ask them. So yeah, Colin, um, so Juan's given us the theoretical background. You're kind of working with people who want to use this. Could you tell us a little bit about those folks? Of course, of course. So uh, it's a two-sided network. So on one side, you have data folks who provide data storage. For example, on the incentivized test net that we've launched today called Space Race, there are over 350 small businesses and individuals that provide storage to the network. And they've, they've actually proven that they have over 230 petabytes of data on the network today um, across six continents, over 30 countries, et cetera. And on the other side are folks looking to store data. And, and the, the way I think about that is today, only 7% of the world's data that gets generated actually gets stored. And that ratio is decreasing over time because there's so much more information being produced and, and not enough places to store it. And the reason is not because we don't want to store that data or it's not useful or important. It's because it's either it's too expensive to store today. You have to ask a, a company or central authority for permission or uh, the storage doesn't have the properties you're looking for. It's not verifiable. It's not decentralized. It's not encrypted. So our focus is really to open up a way for a user to not necessarily move away from the existing cloud storage providers, but focus on that 97% of data that doesn't currently get stored, get, gets completely thrown away and store that in an efficiently priced and decentralized way. Okay. Um, and you guys, did the, did the space race just end yesterday? Did it end or is it still going? Uh, so we, we, uh, we, we, it ended, space race one ended yesterday, but over oh. the last few weeks, we got uh, so much much feedback uh, on on wanting to have a, a second uh, a second uh, space race so that we uh, ended up continuing the the having a second phase to the to space race and that started as the first one ended the second one started and that's going on now okay okay um cool and so you know i know that the racers are all over the world but as i understand it most of the interest i mean like a, a, a i don't know if it's the most a lion's share a, a significant portion of the interest has been in Asia, I think particularly China, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just curious as to why that is. You know, our reporter in Hong Kong has had has been doing a lot of work on this because you've seen all this interest there. Why is it in particular uh, in Asia people want to get involved with Filecoin early? So a big, big part of it is just um, uh, in uh, China has a, a large amount of, of communities um, that are very focused on mining cryptocurrencies in, in general. So um, pretty most most cryptocurrencies that have have any kind of um, uh, large, strong mining component will have a, a large following there. So that's one reason. The second reason is IPFS itself got a, a very large following in, in China as a, as a platform and as a as a technology. Um, uh, and this kind of came together with Ethereum. So there's a lot of Ethereum adoption and Ethereum interest, and that brought in IPFS as well. And then from there, um, uh, IPFS uh, then translated into into Falcon interest for a lot of a lot of participants. So that that's one one big reason. Um, IPFS is the interplanetary file system. It's a it's an open source approach to address data by content, not location, right? That, that that's perfect. That's like the the most succinct way that uh, that I've heard it described yet. So that's fantastic. Um, and uh, the the yeah part of part of the the reasoning there is it's shifting how the web works. Where instead of right now when you visit a website, you are going to that server. Um, you're going to that address and you're going to computers controlled by that that set of parties. We want to move publishing into a world where um, 
you, you want to address all of the information based on what the information is, and you can have information flowing through the network without having to require you to connect to those specific computers in the future. So really making it peer-to-peer -peer and more like, um, say, BitTorrent or Bitcoin um, and, and how that information flow happens, but do that for all websites. And so IPFS is a project to achieve that. Um, now, the one big hole in, in, um, in, in IPFS is just how are you going to incentivize the distribution of data, how you're going to hire people to, to actually store it and so on. And that's where, where Falcon comes in. Uh, IPFS and Falcon are, um, you know, complementary protocols where people can use IPFS on its own um, uh, to address and move around data. Uh, and if they want to hire people to store it, they could go a normal traditional centralized route. They could store it themselves, or they could um, use platforms like Falcon where they're using cryptocurrency to, to hire parties to store their data. And I, I've been following your work for a long time, Juan, so I've heard you talk about this before, and I know one of the things you say that IPFS helps to address is like this idea of link rot. So if any if anyone's ever like looked at an old blog and followed a link, a lot of times those links just don't go anywhere anymore. But, you know, I was thinking about this this morning, and so Filecoin can, sol can solve that with content addressing, like even if it's not in that location anymore, it might be somewhere else. But the problem is, don't you still kind of have the same problem? Because if whoever it is put that data there and is no longer paying for it to be in the world, then it could still just evaporate the same way, right? But but anyone can pay for it. So it doesn't have okay. to be just the original the original author. It, it just has to be anybody who has an interest in it, right? And so with IPFS, what, you move the data distribution model into one where if you're interested in the data staying around for your, either because you want to use it or because um, you care about preserving it or you want to pay or you're getting paid to preserve it, then you can keep it around, right? And so uh, with FFS, you can, you either look at the, at, at, a, at a website and, and copy it and now have it for the future, or you, um, or you're getting paid to distribute it by anybody. Uh, it doesn't have to be the original publisher. And like th that, that shifts the model where, you know, you can, you can go and, and, and create information, publish it to the world, make it part of the public record, make it something that other people should be, should be looking at and, 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 and um, sharing and so on. And you, if, even if you go away, that information can carry on and can continue being being um, being read. So imagine imagine if books worked the way that websites do today, where like only if the original author was still around and paying for the book to be to exist. Uh, uh, and the moment that that author goes away, like all the books in the world just vanish. Like th mm -hmm. that's how websites work today, and it, it's super right. crazy. Uh, we want to move the web more to how books actually work, where. Um, as soon as the, the information is, is made and published um, and it's made part of the public record, then anybody can keep it around and, and, can, and can disseminate it. So this could mean that like the Internet Archive, right, which I assume a lot of people out there watching are familiar with, they use the Wayback Machine to find stuff that's lost. They wouldn't even need, if you use that, you have to go to a new location. You've got to know, oh, it's gone there. What was the URL? Go put it in the Internet Archive. But the Internet Archive could just come along and say, we're just going to pay for an additional copy of the exact same address. So if you click it and the original one's gone, you can just, right? Yeah, exactly right. So so they they could just um, grab all of these extra copies and and um, either pay for them to be backed up or back them up themselves. Mm -hmm. So one of the possibilities here is that with the Internet Archive backing these things up, the Internet Archive itself could start earning revenue as well just by by providing this useful service to the world. Okay. Well, since you brought that up, let's talk about earning revenue. So. Um, what are the different ways in which people can can mine, so to speak, on Filecoin? And uh, you know, what's that look like? What's it take to get involved, et cetera, et cetera? So there's two parts. There's uh, storage mining and retrieval mining. Uh, storage mining uh, follows the the kind of store information and keep it around for a long long time part of the model. So this is like uh, standard data storage. Think of the data going into hard disks and being stored in the long term. Um, the Retrieval mining is more about content delivery and making um, distributing the data that is requested a lot around the world so that it can be um, retrieved very quickly. And so you, you you have kind of this platform with multiple tiers where in the bottom, in the storage mining layer, you can back things up for the very long time. Um, and it can be served, can be stored in a few, uh, say, geographies where you want a few copies around the world for for redundancy and so on. But then if you want it to be distributed extremely quickly and served to users, um, uh, very efficiently and so on, uh, then then the retrieval mining layer comes in where uh, that starts functioning more like a CDN. And so th this allows the market to to look at um, to to really find exactly the the right spot to be. Um, we we want to make the systems not be kind of human and centrally planned, human design and centrally planned, but rather um, use markets to find exactly the right spots of distribution for for all for for the data and enable 
anybody to come in who says, hey, I can actually make this the system much more efficient by putting uh, hardware in this particular part, whether it's long-term storage hardware or uh, you know, kind of fast, fast machines that can distribute data quickly in specific regions um, and really enable them to come in and Cool. And and the, this content delivery network, the CDN thing that you've talked about, that's a that's a very that's an existing business model that also is very important to the existing web right now, right? Yeah, it's critical. So lots of lots of great um, great internet companies have been built around the just the the, the content delivery uh, delivery part of the picture. So you know, think, uh, companies like Cloudflare and Fastly and others, where um, uh, you know they focus entirely on the problem of. Uh, how do you distribute uh, content to the people that are trying to view it as fast as possible and you make load times on the web really, really, really fast. Uh, we want to move all of this world, not in terms of kind of, um, we, we, we want to create a structure where it's a marketplace like, so imagine like the Airbnb model where there's a lot of hotels that are maybe established uh, uh, chains and very large uh, um, companies and so on around the world. And then you have a vast amount of, of potential supply of, of, uh, of, um, rooms and so on all over the world in, in specific settings and so on, uh, a marketplace comes in to enable that, uh, that, that, uh, that additional supply to come into the market. And so that's, that's what we want to do with Falcon. We want to enable not just the, the current existing CDNs and so on to participate, but we want to enable all kinds of other machines around the world to, uh, to compete in this market. Cool. Um, and, you know, I was talking to, um, to Wolfie, one of our reporters who, who follows, you know, largely mining in China. And he had said to me that one of the things he was hearing in China is you guys just did this document that came out, um, sort of the economic engineering the Falcon economy. Uh, and I just did an explainer on it on uh, on CoinDesk, which I feel like I explained things without explaining it, but you know whatever. Um, but uh, one of the things he was saying is is he's hearing a little bit that some some folks in China are a bit daunted by the amount of collateral that's required. So can you talk a little bit about? The upfront costs for China to for a, for a, any miner to participate and and kind of why that makes sense for them and sort of and why it's I guess as as high as it is. Yeah, so this is a it's a great question. Um, the collaterals in Falcon come in because uh, the protocol needs a way of verifying that parties are doing um, are behaving correctly. So, uh, for example, if you if you as a miner promise the network and promise a user that you're going to store their data in the long term. And then you don't. Um, now, uh, th then that would be like a really terrible so, uh, storage network, right? And so we we need to align the incentives so that um, parties that commit to store data for users are indeed going to do so. And if they're going to not do that anymore, um, there needs to be a, a significant negative consequence. So the, the collaterals are there uh, across the protocol to to ensure good behaviors um, in various different parts. So some parts of that is just the long-term storage. Other parts is maintaining consensus and so on. Uh, the the large collateral requirements are matched. So, so the, the reason collateral ended up being pretty large is that collateral is matched to the earnings, and so it's a proportion of the of the earnings. So the collateral is really a fraction of what people might end up earning by storing this data in the long term. Um, like and it has to be fraction? tied to. Are we talking five percent? Um, are we talking fifty percent? Are we talking seventy percent? Uh, I, I don't remember, recall the exact percentage right now, but it, it it has to be some large percentage to ensure that you don't you you can get into a situation where. Um, if you can make more money than the collaterals, you can uh, start playing games where uh, if the protocol isn't checking in a specific point in time, you can cheat the network um, and end up making way more money uh, before the network catches you. And so the, 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 the pain has to be, the, like the, the, uh, the penalties have to be just high enough to make sure that those incentives uh, work out in the, long, in the long run. And so there's, there's like a, a high degree of, uh, of, of careful tuning that has to go into, into this. Uh, different mechanisms can exist over time that that potentially reduce the, these um, these fees. One of the one of the most active areas of protocol design that we are doing right now, and 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 we foresee will go deep into you know for the next many years, is exactly tuning tuning economic parameters like these over time based on data and how things are actually functioning. So one of the things where we learned from the space race as an example is one one particular um, fee structure is especially punitive, and we need to reduce that 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 pain point. Dramatically, and so that's one of the learnings over the last three weeks. Is hey, this particular mechanism um, uh, is over is over uh, punishing in this period, and so shifting that fee structure so that it's way less less painful um, and it costs way less uh, at the beginning, and only if kind of continued misbehavior is shown, 
than actually um, get into like the higher numbers. That's one of the, the things that we're using things like space race to figure out and then adjust the protocol. So it's kind of like this evolution of um, you you make a model, you test the model, you can um, analytically try to find like the right solution. Uh, you can simulate a lot of it and, and get into a really good good uh, plan. But then then you actually have to test it with a lot of people and and test it in in in, um, in a setting as close to the real incentives world as you can, and then see how it actually behaves. And so you know the I guess one piece of good news is like really we we only found like this one particular one that was particularly painful. The rest that um, are actually fairly fairly good. Um, and so now we just have to adjust this this one, and then okay. then we should be in a much better spot. Yeah, that's all. Uh, it's all really thoughtful and interesting. I don't really know why you're worried about it. Um, this is crypto. No one would ever pull a hustle just to make money. Um, but you know, uh, an ounce of precaution, I guess, is worth a pound of cure. Um, so, uh, Colin, maybe you could tell us a little bit about folks who who want this kind of solution. Like, are there companies out there? We know there's some decentralized web companies, you know, who are who are trying to build markets right now and things like sharing music and etc. Are there companies who are eager to get going with Filecoin when it launches? Definitely. So we have over 80 kind of larger credible organizations building on testnet today and over 150 kind of hacker projects that have evolved through some of the various hackathons that ETH Global and Spark University have put on. Um, and that completely spans the gamut. So it's kind of like think of it like Dropbox style apps. Fleek's one of my favorites. They have an application called Space that's privacy focused, encrypted, a peer to peer replacement for kind of Dropbox or, or Google Drive built on top of IPFS and Filecoin. You have uh, video streaming apps that are built on Live Peer and Filecoin, uh, which, which are amazing. And then you have like really large data sets um, that are looking to be archived in a certain way. So one of my favorites there is the Shoah Foundation, which is a database of Holocaust related video testimony from 55,000 survivors across nine, nine genocides, it's nine petabytes of recordings. And a property that they really appreciate about Filecoin is that it's actually verifiable. You can trace that data back to the actual person you know, who created that video. And so it really spans the gamut of different use cases. And um, I'm sure when Joe comes on, he'll, he'll talk a little bit about the DeFi use cases as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so we'll, um, yeah, we're going to bring on Joe Lubin from Consensus soon. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, if you have questions and you're watching on Twitter, uh, hashtag internet2030. If you're on YouTube, just use the chat. Um, so you mentioned privacy, uh, Colin, one thing that either one of you can answer that I was curious about. You know, one of the things that's so cool about the DeFi world in Ethereum is that, um, you know, I can borrow money and no one knows who I am. It's wild. Um, am I going to have to KYC to, you know, store some files on Filecoin or is it going to be permissionless in a similar way? It's permissionless. So so any party can can create an, an, an identity on the network the same way that you do in in, um, in, in Bitcoin or Ethereum. And you can um, then from there, you can you can store you can store data. Um, th there is a part of the protocol where going through for, for larger scale users, like users that want to store many petabytes and, and uh, potentially exabytes of data, um, we want to create a structure where um, those parties can get a, a, a significant kind of like cost reduction over, over time once you get into these high volumes. And so that part has a, a, um, a kind of uh, verification to make sure that you're not really a miner posing as a user. There's, there's kind of like holes uh, that you need to close in the protocol where like miners, if miners pretend to be users, they could like um, create oh, right. deals with themselves and so on. Right. Uh, so you have to like just make sure that like that doesn't happen in the larger scales. Right. But for most, for most, um, uh, uh, uses if you're not kind of um for like most of the data for most people um anybody can join in with without any kind of identity relationship whatsoever and just to spell that out for listeners a little bit so we, i got this from your recent document you came you put out so it crazily enough you know for for perfectly good reasons you can actually earn a little bit of file coin by storing empty blocks on there because it gives some capacity to the network obviously you guys don't want people to do that you i mean you want some number of people to do that but not that many you want people to store real stuff and so what you're saying is someone could could sort of get um, could trick the verification system. They say yes, we have real storage needs. Uh, just store to yourself, pay yourself, and you would get you would get much better block rewards for doing that. And that's the kind of thing that you you're trying to work to avoid, right? Yeah, exactly. So the so the the mechanism is that um, the block reward is coming in as a very significant uh, incentive and subsidy over storage. So we you can you can kind of have this fire hose of 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 um, of tokens that are coming out of the block reward, and they're getting distributed out to all of the parties storing storing data, and so you have this this problem where yeah, if you add capacity to the network, that's really valuable, and that should get get paid out. Uh, but we want to be able to incentivize 
actually storing real users' data way more than just capacity, uh, like you know, kind of an order of magnitude more, because uh, at the end of the day, like that's the goal. Uh, now, if you just naively uh, apply a multiplier for just saying that you're storing users' data, then it's very easy for for miners to be like, oh yeah, like you know, here's like a different civil identity that is pretending to be uh, a user, and we're just going to hire myself. Yeah, sure, I'm storing real data. It's not actually real data. Um, and so that's where uh, for larger, this only really matters at the larger scales once you get into like the many petabytes to exabytes. At those scales, you it's important and valuable uh, to then say, okay, well, if you have these users that are storing tens to hundreds of petabytes, like who exactly, um, uh, who are these parties? And if they want to, if they want to make use of that massive subsidy, like a, this huge kind of like extra incentive that's going to give them a huge cost reduction, then in those cases, that that kind of verification comes into play. Uh, but we we think of verification also also being able to be done without kind of revealing without KYC or revealing identity at, at all. Um, it could be done in different ways. It's just a matter of making sure they're not really miners cheating cheating the, the right. economy. So. Um... So you guys did an update a few weeks ago uh, about what was going on with Falcoin. There was a lot of interesting things in there, but um, I think the big thing the broader public was most inter interested in was you said that you were very likely to do mainnet launch this month, you know, mid-September to end, in, in, so the end of September. We are at mid-September now. When I talked to Ian earlier this month, he was like, that description is still accurate. So um, can you give us a date today? Uh, I, we unfortunately can't give a date, uh, but we, we have kind of like our, our window um, uh, established in the, in, the, in, in the project. So out of the outputs of Space Race and all of the things that we learned there, we have a few things left over that to, to kind of fix and, and adjust. Um, as soon as we can uh, clear those out, then, then we'll, be, we'll be ready to go. Uh, so that's, that's the, um, we're very close. We're like, you know, some number of weeks away, um, but uh, we, we want to actually fix a proper date once we, we, once we can you know, fully commit to it and say like, okay, great. Like once we say this, this particular day, like we, we, um, uh, we stick to it. Is it still going to have a nine in the front of it? Uh, in a, September. a, uh, oh, got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Okay. So one thing I have to ask is, uh, Axios did a report last month that said that you guys had a mediation going on with some of your early investors over token sales. You guys came along before there were really norms around those things and sort of that process really evolved a few months later. Um, so does the fact that you guys are moving forward, can we take that to mean that that mediation is all resolved and things are sorted out there? Uh, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we can't comment on any of the, uh, we, in general, PL does not publicly comment on any kind of private conversations that we might have with, with folks. Uh, you can imagine that when, um, when, uh, uh, you, in large situations where there's a lot of a lot of uh, money at stake and so on, um, uh, people appear uh, and so on, and so that there's a we, we're sorting it out and we have we have found like a pretty um, a, a good path and so uh, it, it's it's all it's close or it looks good or or something like that. It, it's, sorry, we can't we can't we can't really comment. It's it's uh it's uh, sorted out. Okay, okay, sounds good. Um, so just one last question before we, we bring on Joe. Um, you know, one of the things which people have said uh, on Twitter and elsewhere, and you know, I certainly sort of felt this every time I dug into Filecoin is this is just a very complex thing with a lot of moving parts. You know, Ethereum came on and said, we can do complex things, but we're really just a computer. You guys have the complex things built in from the beginning. So why can we be confident that this massive machine is, is not just gonna seize up two months after taking on, you know, a a few billion piles of data. Um, I mean, th th that's it's a, it's meant to be a market, and it's meant to be uh, a system where um, people uh, and capacity is added, and users are using the the, the system to a certain uh, level, and it, that should adjust based on based on on demand and supply, finding like the right price, right? So as as usage goes up, and as maybe the the chain saturation. Um, uh, in chain bandwidth uh, and throughput kind of get saturated, that should bump up the price over time. So think of like the the chain congestion problems that all blockchains have right now. Um, those will definitely affect uh, affect Falcon as well. Uh, and that's where like having a really good market system for that uh, is really key. So that's you know one of the the things that we've seen that's fantastic from the uh, that's coming out, out around this from the Ethereum communities EIP fifteen fifty nine I, th uh, I think it's the number uh, is a new gas model for for how to do um, transactions uh, in, in, in congested blockchains. And so we're, we're pioneering 
with that and then we're trying it out and, and seeing how it goes so it's one one part at the end of the day it's just a supply and demand mar market right so if the, if the if there's a massive demand for the service that will just bump all the prices up so uh you mentioned ethereum there that's a great transition let's bring in joseph lubin the founder of consensus uh one of the co-founders of ethereum uh a guy who has been interested in uh web3 for a long time uh welcome mr lubin hey brady how are you doing i'm great it's great to see hey, you Robin. hey colin hey joe so like I said, you know, um, I've been covering consensus for a while. I know from consensus's early days, um, your company has been one that's very interested in this idea of Web3. Maybe it's good to start with you giving uh, your own take why that's been a, a bet that you've been willing to take for a long time and, and kind of how you've seen that story evolve over the years. Sure. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, this is a moment in history, which is uh, a particularly poignant given given recent events. Um, it is an opportunity to um, build new technological infrastructure that can change the nature of trust um, for the planet. Uh, and so these decentralized protocols, uh, distributed storage protocols um, have uh, the ability to, uh, as Juan likes to say, to um, guarantee verification of, uh, of certain activities, certain transactions, uh, veridicality of data, uh, tamper-proof um, uh, consensus systems, agreement systems, tamper-proof data systems. And, and so um, we, uh, with blockchains, uh, have the ability to build decentralized protocols from maximal decentralization. You get uh, increased trust. Um, and essentially in blockchain systems, everybody can uh, come to the understanding of exactly what happened and, and when it happened and those things that happened uh, and agreed upon uh, are agreed upon are non-repudiable uh, because overturning the history becomes uh, prohibitively expensive. So uh, we have this opportunity um, to build an automated uh, objective trust foundation for the planet um, and um, more recently upon that trust foundation we're seeing a financial plumbing layer emerge uh, where we have these uh, decentralized financial protocols being built on ethereum and other protocols are, are connecting in um, and so um, the trust layer the trust foundation enables the financial layer the financial layer enables lots of applications lots of applications require uh, other kinds of decentralized protocols especially protocols for decentralized storage for decentralized bandwidth for decentralized identity for decentralized heavy compute and so that's what we think of uh, when we uh, say web3 uh, web3 is uh, a new it infrastructure for the planet for the planet uh, that uh, brings greater trust in a, in a time when greater uh, automated trust is necessary, um, and it will consist of many uh, interoperating decentralized protocols. And uh, uh, some of those protocols uh, are represented uh, on the panel here today uh, in the form of IPFS, Filecoin, Ethereum, and, and many others uh, going forward, I'm sure. So, so let me just say that back to you to see if I sort of uh, have that right. But like you're, you're basically saying we sort of got Bitcoin and Ethereum, which sort of both know who owns what. And then Ethereum kind of is also able to do like who's agreed to what. Um, and then you've got other protocols that sort of say who's going to do what, right? I mean, that's sort of like the, the stack that we're describing here with those different layers that you articulated. Did I, is that roughly right? There's nothing there that I can argue with, um, but but it's, it's obviously really quite uh, expansive and, and complex uh, beyond that. Okay. So uh, it's cool, Joe, that you're here with one. Uh, usually when... Uh, new protocols come along. We all know in crypto, well, Falcon isn't really new, but sort of, you know, newly coming onto the scene in a, in a real way. Um, the, the business is uh, every existing protocol uh, just says the new thing's garbage. Uh, and so we've got Ethereum showing up alongside Filecoin. What are you guys going to do together? Um, so Juan and I go back pretty far since uh, the early days of the decentralized protocol ecosystem. So we've, uh, uh, we've been watching the development of each other's ecosystem, and, and it's really a pretty significantly integrated pair of ecosystems. Um, I view um, uh, 
guaranteed execution of agreements and trusted transactions on, on networks like Ethereum uh, as complementary to uh, distributed storage and uh, decentralized blockchains that uh, mediate markets around uh, distributed storage. And so um, it really is a match made in heaven. There, I, there may be around the edges, uh, very small ways where, where um, we're overlapping in the sense of providing the same functionality, but uh, from really early on at consensus and throughout the Ethereum ecosystem, when we built decentralized applications on Ethereum, we needed uh, efficient and uh, sort of next generation web three type distributed storage. And so we've always been building uh, with IPFS. Um, mm -hmm. Our Infura infrastructure service, I think way back in 2016, uh, began to offer APIs uh, for IPFS, um, essentially enabling uh, many people building applications within consensus or, or out in the world uh, to uh, store data in, in that uh, uh, distributed protocol. Um, we uh, continue to work to enhance our APIs. There, there's a pretty significant effort underway right now to um, really heavily professionalize our, our offering around IPFS through Infura. Um, yeah. I believe we're already facilitating the storage of, of something like 40 million unique objects and, and handle two terabytes of data daily wow. uh, through IPFS. So um, great. It, it's, been a, it's been a long uh, collaboration and uh, um, uh, the two ecosystems are likely to grow even more interwoven uh, and cool. uh, and be synergistic with each other over time. And Juan and Colin, what's your perspective? What's what's Ethereum good for for Filecoin? Oh, Ethereum is awesome. I, I think, you know, going back to 2014, 15, that entire period um, just seeded uh, an amazing community that has just every year continued to bl blow, out, blow away everybody uh, uh, else out of the water in terms of the creativity and um, research into new directions and actual products being used by by a lot of folks. So we we consider ourselves a, a very um, uh, not only ourselves as a as a group and as a company in terms of Pro Collabs, but really the entire IPFS ecosystem and and all of Filecoin to be very tightly um, tightly integrated um, and be uh, kind of part of um, the, the Ethereum ecosystem uh, in a big way. So there's all kinds of intertwining of, of protocols where um, really comes down to the application and what does the application need. In a lot of cases, um, hey, it's just kind of like we're trying to distribute some information. IPFS is a great case for that. Hey, we're trying to distribute information and back it up in the long term. Hey, IPFS and Filecoin is a good use for that. Um, hey, we, we're trying to build a, an application with that should be around for long term and it has all this, you know, business complex logic um, or or any kind of facilitating of transactions between users where you need smart contracts. That's like a perfect uh, environment for, for mixing um, the, three, the three systems together. Uh, one other area that, um, that we're, we're super excited about is, is just the, the whole rise of, of um, kind of uh, both NFTs and, and, um, and things where you have kind of digital property uh, and that digital property has some information associated with it. Um, whether that's um, kind of digital goods or it's titles to actual property property in the in the in the uh, you know uh, real world, whether it's houses or things like that, all of that is a great great uh, venue for for a marriage between uh, between Ethereum, IPFS, and Filecoin, where um, you can build these applications that leverage each of these protocols for um, for great to build a, a really good system. Uh, the the other thing I'll say is um, we don't know what the what the the future of the of the um, blockchain ecosystem holds. We do know that we are hitting this like very difficult, um, you know, throughput problem with with uh, in, in consensus and in just in general. Um, you have a a, a hard uh, kind of block around how many transactions can make it into into a block. And this is where I think Ethereum is is far ahead of uh, of most other groups. Where you know the the scalability proposals for Ethereum two um, and kind of the Ethereum two network is proving out um, where a lot of the future is likely going to be. Um, and so we're we're uh, not only paying close attention and seeing how we we can we can interface with that, um, but also how um, you know in, in the future it could very well be that things develop over many years where um, tier one blockchains look very different than they do today, um, and you might see like this this uh, um, this different platform where things like Filecoin and and and, and Ethereum are using the same consensus chain and so on. So like the, we 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 are 
um, very, very excited and, and, and thankful to, to be part of this uh, community that is driving forward all of this work. Um, and so we're, we're super, um, we're paying very close attention to where all of that is, is headed and participating in it. One thing I thought of uh, reading about the token economics of Filecoin, I, this was just a speculative thing I wrote, but it's sort of a thing that does seem like a crossover is one of the surprising things about Filecoin is generally speaking, if you're buying storage on there, you, you pay up front. I mean, you don't exactly pay, like the miner doesn't get all of it, but you do need to put it somewhere up front, which, is, which can be daunting for a business. And one of the things I wondered is, you know, the people in the DeFi world are so good at coming up with these clever models for sort of like managing prices and stuff. I wondered if there wouldn't be a way in which someone could invent a thing maybe on Ethereum that was just like, well, you don't actually have to pay it all up front. We'll finance it and we'll, you can pay us monthly or whatever you want. Um, is that a, the kind of partnership we might see coming through? Let me jump in there really quickly with a short answer. Uh, at Consensus uh, in our Codifier Commerce and Decentralized Finance Group, we have actually been thinking about uh, the Filecoin protocol um, and the file token. Um, and uh, we noticed that there are potentially some exciting opportunities um, around the protocol and around the token in decentralized finance. And uh, um, I'm not gonna say much more on that front, but uh, we're doing some real thinking in our uh, sort of DeFi skunk works team uh, about cool. uh, um, what we can build. If, uh, if you just spotted this on Twitter, um, I'm Brady Dale with Coindesk. I'm here with Juan Benet and Colin Everin of Filecoin, uh, building the, the new decentralized data structure for the internet and Joe Lubin, the founder of Consensus. Um, one of the major shops that's driving things on Ethereum. Um, you know, while we've been talking about IPFS here, we had a question from uh, someone watching. And again, if you have questions, uh, hashtag internet2030 on Twitter or use the YouTube chat. Uh, but someone asked, is is um, the growth, can 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 folks expect that the, the growth of the use of, of IPFS, the Inter interplanetary file protocol, should that provide stability to the Filecoin token um, if you know another bear market hits, is that something that people can cross their fingers and hope for? Well, it's it's a uh, I mean you know um, it's extremely markets are inherently uh, impossible to predict, or you know good markets are inherently impossible to predict uh, because you should have gone to a, a very efficient place where uh, most information and knowledge is is encoded in there. Um, the usage will drive usage of Filecoin um, will drive more and more clients to. Um, pay for storage, and that payment of storage will come in as rewards for for Filecoin, um, Filecoin miners. And when users pay for for storage, they have to do so in Filecoin. So that demand over of of the token itself um, will hopefully bring it, bring stability to the to the to the network. But this is again um, kind of economic design policy questions where we'll see. We, you can try and set up the incentives in such a way, uh, but at the end of the day, you'll you'll the market will 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 show you what, what what will actually happen. So we think that you know anything that really increases the usage and uh, demand for the Filecoin storage service um, to translate into a much better economy for uh, for Filecoin. We think of modeling this as like think of a, kind of like an island economy where there's kind of raw materials that are you know hard drives and um, data centers and so on, and miners are coming together, um, purchasing those raw materials, putting them together into the service of cloud storage. And then providing that service, exporting it out to the rest of the world, um, so the rest of the world is is paying for that service. And so that you, you can think of of Falcon as the as the um, currency, as like the, the national currency of that island nation. Um, and so as the exports, uh, if the, if the, if the island nation is really good at turning those raw materials into a good and efficient uh, um, storage system, then the exports will will. Um, uh, support that support that currency, and so this is kind of you know uh, standard uh, national currency economics. If you look at how the internet and the web developed, uh, it was uh, a set of functionalities that were limited early on. Uh, the web was all about information early on. It, it came to be about uh, e-commerce. It came to be about mobility. It came to be about social networks. Those were fundamental primitives that enabled us to do so much more and, and uh, build so many more use cases, drawing in all of nearly all of humanity. Um, in the decentralized protocol world, uh, which will lead to an increasingly decentralized worldwide web, we have uh, some blockchain primitives and, and we're um, 
very excited about new primitives. Uh, new primitives uh, like decentralized identity, uh, decentralized bandwidth, and uh, especially uh, decentralized storage. It's not uh, strictly a new primitive, uh, but it's coming online uh, as a market um, that will incentivize uh, many people to build uh, rich infrastructure uh, to enable developers to use it. And uh, uh, it's going to, I believe, drive this uh, decentralized economy uh, forward and, and create a real fundamental utility. So uh, the vicissitudes that uh, uh, we have seen in the decentralized protocol ecosystem and that makes sense in a, an emerging economy are likely to get smoothed out by, by more fundamental value being created. So Joe, I'm glad you brought up um, sort of the early days of the internet, because that's a thing I wanted to ask about. I, I will say one, I think this is a common critique we see of this chunk of work in crypto. And it's one thing I thought about a lot. You know, I remember a world before the internet, really. I mean, you know, it was kind of there, but it wasn't like really there. And, uh, and then the internet came along and it happened, you know, when it started to become real, it happened pretty fast. And then the mobile web came along and social web came along. And that like exploded insanely fast, like almost as soon as it existed, like everyone was using it. That is profoundly not been the story for Web3. Like th this, this is stuff has been available for a while and folks just are not rushing to it. So why should we believe that that, that day will come, that they will understand why they want this? Because it, it hasn't happened in quite the same way as it did for Web2. So the web protocols were invented in 1989, um, took a decade before, uh, you know, sort of bare bones functionality email was uh, was really interesting to lots of human beings. Um, it took another 10 years uh, uh, for mobile and social to, to really hit their stride. So that's, uh, uh, that's 20 years. Um, I feel like we had a a uh, pretty slow start against a lot of headwinds in the first five years of the decentralized protocol. Rev well, okay, not not going back to BitTorrent, but going back to to just Bitcoin um, in the blockchain space. Uh, there were five years before smart contracts were really a thing. So we're maybe five or six years into uh, this particular revolution. From from my perspective, I I think that's uh, roughly um, the timeline for distributed storage as well, at least uh, in the context of, of WAN and protocol labs. And so uh, I feel like it's early days. I feel like uh, we have to build these enabling layers. So we've got this enabling uh, trust foundation, which is enabling uh, financial plumbing, uh, which is going to, uh, I think, provide the uh, broad and deep financial infrastructure for a whole new kind of economy. Um, I would argue that uh, America's economy is the strongest economy in the world for a few reasons, but one of the major reasons is because it has the, the broadest and deepest financial um, infrastructure on the planet. And so uh, that's what we're building. We're building it in a democratic way um, with a tremendous amount of experimentation and innovation and the, uh, the speed of innovation is just astonishing uh, in the DeFi space. And uh, I think we'll benefit from that uh, quite rapidly going forward. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I, I think one of the things that happens as well is that the changes are very deep and quite large, but because they don't look like a, an app that you can download on an app store and get, you know, kind of millions of people on, um, it doesn't feel the same way. Mm -hmm. So the, the kind of financial infrastructure and, and um, legal, and not exactly legal, but uh, like um, law oriented, um, you know, think of like smart contracts as a platform, the, the, the those kinds of innovations are incredibly powerful and super deep and have a huge amount of, of, of following and use. Massive amounts of value are flowing through them in ways that the social networks at the beginning, even when they were very popular, weren't seeing that level of, of, of value um, moving through those systems. So it's a, it's a different kind of innovation and a different kind of, um, of, of change. It's a, it's a platform and rails sort of change uh, mm -hmm. first. And so the a lot of the years at the beginning aren't going to be as palpable to to the end users. Now I think the flip side of that is as we get a lot more of this new plumbing for Web3 put into place, things like file storage, things like um, better com uh, distributed computation, and so on. Um, different. We still have a lot of things to figure out of how all of these systems interface with browsers, let alone mobile uh, 
uh, platforms. As those platforms, as we figure out how all of those interfaces are are going to work out, um, which is, I think is still kind of early days on, on figuring those pieces out, then we'll be able to have that kind of explosion, right? So social networks, quote, you know, were like a short period, but that's because they were writing on, on you know, 10 years of, of development of the web and browser and so on to the point where like they were basically there and they were able to do what they did. Um, in, in the, if you were trying to build a social network like that today on, on Web3, you encounter a whole bunch of challenges that you then have to go and fix. So you, you're, you're, you, you're, what we're seeing right now is a lot of uh, teams that go after, hey, let's build this like one shiny product for end users and they encounter large problems to solve. And so then they start solving those and creating value. And as, as those get filled out, um, then you're you're actually putting things into the into the the possibility of of that like, you know really fast growth. I, I expect that you know within it's, it's hard to make predictions on this and it's hard to like pinpoint a specific year, but um, I think we're fairly close to the, to the first set of like broadly consumer oriented applications that will be crypto entirely crypto native. And what will probably happen is um, Kind of like with that, most innovations, people will be like, oh, well, that doesn't count because X and X will be like, you know, some random reason like, oh, it doesn't count because it, it's still like a, an app that has to be distributed through an app store because you know, that's kind of like how the rails work. Or, hey, that doesn't count because um, maybe uh, it doesn't make users think about keys or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, there, people will come up with a bunch of reasons. And so you'll start seeing a number of applications that will, um, and maybe it's already happening, uh, where uh, people are, are actually already transitioned and it'll suddenly be, we'll, we'll have a flip where everyone will say like, oh yeah, of course, Web3 was always it from the beginning. Like, of course it all made sense. And that'll be kind of like past some inflection point. And, and it's hard to tell exactly when this happened. That, that sort of thing happened with social too. There was a long time when people uh, disregarded um, Facebook and, and MySpace and all these things as like, oh, the things that like kids are playing with and that'll mm -hmm. never replace uh, anything. Um, and then suddenly that transition and that inflection point happened very quickly after um, you know, people notice that, that that after that inflection point. So I, I expect that something like that will happen with consumer oriented oriented systems as well. Yeah. Colin, it looks like you had something you wanted to jump in on in there. Yeah, it, you know, another thing that's just additive here is is the number of founders and entrepreneurs and developers that can help solve the user experience problems to open up what we're doing here, the building the rails to, to to the, to the world so that every man, woman, child, every company in the world is engaged in this. And, you know, we've, we've benefited a lot from what Consensus has done and, and admired and learned from how they brought um, a whole community in. And, and we're trying to emulate that in, in building the Filecoin ecosystem and how to, how to attract really smart, you know, developers, entrepreneurs, and founders to help build the applications that need to do this. And we've been fortunate to, to partner with Consensus in an accelerator program to, to do just that. Yeah, to your, to your point, uh, Juan, about people sort of dismissing things for a long time, like I remember a time when there was a popular t-shirt that said, I don't want to read your blog, you know, and now WordPress is 30% of the internet, you know, so um, these things just do, they just sort of do move forward. And, you know, to your point, Colin, yeah, one of the things I find so interesting about decentralized stuff is there's ways in which, I mean, it's buggy and it's slow and all that stuff, but there's ways in which it makes this, these dramatic leaps forward in user experience, but they're hard for people to understand. You know, so like Muneeb Ali, a lot of times at Blockstack talks about it being able to just log into the internet and then just already being logged in everywhere that you go, you know, and a similar thing happens on Ethereum too. Um, and, it's, and it's exciting uh, and it's cool once you get it but it takes a little while to get it, you know? And like, that's, that's one of the hard parts is it's a little, it's a little hard for people to understand for a while. And then, then it's amazing once they do, uh, but it can be tough. I think we're just right on the cusp there. You know, if you, if you use Audius, which is a, a, a music streaming player, mm -hmm. uh, it, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's on decentralized tech and, and not centralized tech. Um, you know, uh, we had this really big moment where Opera integrated IPFS natively into their browser, so it just opened by default, and that just enables a whole bunch of use cases that are just so native to to the decentralized ethos. And so, I, I really think we're just right on the cusp there. So, um, that is a go great example because it uses Ethereum and IPFS and uses all these these uh, kind of complex under the hood systems, and it's a consumer application that you can download on, on an app store today. And, and play around with and like you don't have to think about any of that complexity it's so, like that's a good example of like you know people eventually claim like oh that doesn't count because x um but that's a that's a you know live example of that of that working yeah so one thing that's exciting to me is that uh, i think finally we're moving into the 
uh, natural or, or native uh, utilization of digital technology. Um, uh, when TV was invented, the first thing people did was uh, implement radio plays on, on television, and, and it took quite a while to figure out how to use that medium properly. Um, mm -hmm. When the internet and web were invented, um, we uh, brought over um, some of the patterns of the legacy economy. Um, so it took a while to figure out how to do money, and, and we've made credit cards uh, after uh, sort of them being illegal on the inter on, on the web, on the internet for a little while, um, we made them viable. Um, uh, we sort of brought over the um, book sales. We brought over uh, blogs, uh, long form reading of, uh, of linear text. Um, as we move into a world of decentralized protocols, um, we're bringing over new rails uh, for the creation uh, and full life cycle of value, value tokens. Uh, we're bringing over uh, decentralized governance. So uh, it, it's really the um, foundational aspects of society that are moving from their previous analog forms into natively digital forms. Uh, and that's going to uh, create fluidity, um, hopefully much greater agency uh, for many more people in small businesses um, with respect to economics, with respect to identity, with respect to personal information. Uh, so um, it's a big transformation. Um, I think quite a lot bigger than the internet and web transformation, um, despite the fact that it had, that those had such profound effects on global society. Um, and I think we're just, we've got a whole world, uh, generations of entrepreneurs and technologists and users who have been thinking about this stuff, um, you know, bringing over uh, advertising from, from the television medium may not have been that great an idea. Um, so uh, we have different ways of incentivizing activity and behavior uh, through these uh, distributed protocols. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, building a much more decentralized world. So we're, we're super close to the end. Um, I just want to say a, a quick point off of what um, what Joe just said is, uh, you know, he, he had mentioned that that this new web is really reinventing money. If, if sort of you've drifted away from crypto, but you've been interested in Filecoin for a while and you came back to this uh, just to see what Juan's up to, um, please go out and Google decentralized finance and yield farming and see just sort of how weird money is getting right now. Uh, this technology is making things very, very different. Um, and so on that note, um, you know, we just, just in a couple minutes, Juan, you know, I give you a lot of credit as being someone who can really see the future in a unique way. Um, can you just sort of give us your most science fiction view of what might be possible in a future of decentralized web in like in two minutes before we close? Uh, wow. Um, I mean, I think, um, We're very quickly moving to a world where most of the activity that we're doing um, is becoming verifiable and in, in, in kind of deep and important ways. And so all kinds of interactions that right now rely on trust or centralized parties or kind of asking for permission to certain authorities will become um, kind of driven by by protocols and driven by by good behaviors. Um, and it really uh, is, I think the, the most fundamental shift that's happening is that the evolution of the platform has been, has been happening um, uh, so quickly in this very large open source permissionless uh, innovation mode where we are really kind of economies, it, it's really kind of a software eating, uh, eating economies and, and law and jurisdictions and so on in, in a really, really deep, deep way uh, to the point where kind of when we look back 10, 20 years from now, um, uh, I, I sort of expect most large scale um, uh, kind of value transfers in new applications to be, and in value here, here could be not just not just things like like money and assets, but but really value in terms of attention or or um, uh, valuable interactions between people and so on to be mediated by verifiable protocols. And so, um, you know, kind of the the really promising part of this is that new kinds of incentive structures and new kinds of organizing people um, will emerge out of the, this, and will you know I think like the 
the you know, DAOs are one example of of a thing that's been some old idea has been around in the in the industry for a while now, and and I think it's gonna it's it's one of those things where like um, kind of like cryptocurrency was around for 10, 15 years before Bitcoin uh, as an idea. Uh, it's gone. It's going to um, be extremely fundamental. It's going to lead a charge to to be uh, to a very different way of organizing humans, um, and it's just a, the very beginning of, of of that larger larger evolution. So hopefully we can make um, add rights to the entire network. So one of the big things uh, that I think we are we have up for us right now is we well, have I the gotta, ability to. We got it. We got to close there. But um, but thanks a ton uh, to everyone for being here. I'm really crossing my fingers that. Uh, all this stuff will make the web weird again. Uh, join us tomorrow at roughly the same time for the second part of Internet 2030. Uh, we'll be again on with Consensus, uh, John Wolpert of Consensus, and Brendan Eich will be here along with Emily Parker from Coindesk team, uh, looking even deeper into what we can expect in this new era of the web. Uh, thanks a lot to Juan, to Colin, to Joe for joining us, and for all of you out there watching. And guaranteed, uh, when Filecoin does finally announce they're going live, you will find it on coindesk.com. Thanks a lot, everybody. Oh, thanks, Freddie. Thanks, guys. Thank you.